Renewable energy sources are those that can be replenished at or near the rate of consumption and reused. Wood is commonly used as a fuel in the forms of firewood and charcoal. It is often used in developing countries because it is easily accessible. In developing countries, cooking is commonly done over a fire sustained this way. Mr. W, however, also uses biomass fuel when he cooks. I absolutely love barbecue and I use briquettes and lump charcoal which are both biomass fuel. Wood is a biomass fuel, meaning it's energy derived from a biological source. While it does produce heat for energy at a low cost, it produces a lot of carbon monoxide and particulate matter, which can be harmful to respiratory health, especially if it is used indoors with poor ventilation. The overharvesting of trees for this fuel can also lead to deforestation. But there is a biomass fuel we see commonly in the developed world too, and that's ethanol. Ethanol is added to gasoline to reduce the amount of oil we need to use, and it can almost be completely substituted for gasoline in certain cars. Burning of ethanol doesn't introduce additional carbon into the atmosphere because it's carbon neutral. The carbon in the ethanol was absorbed from the atmosphere through photosynthesis when corn, the major crop we grow for ethanol production was, well, growing. However, the energy return on energy investment for ethanol is low, meaning it takes quite a bit of energy to actually get it, and we don't get that much out of it. Biomass is the most common form of renewable energy used all around the world. However, it's only considered renewable if trees are grown faster than they are removed, which is not currently the case. Hydroelectric power is the most common form of renewable energy aside from biomass. Hydroelectric power can be generated in several ways. Dams built across rivers collect water in reservoirs which are then released through the dam. That moving water is used to spin a turbine which spins a generator which produces electricity. Turbines can also be placed directly along rivers without a specific reservoir, and the flow of the river spins the turbine. Another way to produce hydroelectric power is through utilizing the tides, or the rise and fall of sea levels as caused by the combined effect of gravitational forces on the Earth from the Moon and the Sun, and the rotation of the Earth, technically. As the waters proceed and recede, the flow of the water through the tidal power mechanism spins a turbine, which spins a generator, which produces electricity. I'm sure we get the point about that one already. There are some issues related to hydroelectric energy use. Uh, tidal facilities are along coastlines, and the building of them reduces the range of coastal ecosystems. Keeping in mind that coastal environments support 90% of all marine species, this can become an issue, but Right now, there just aren't enough of these tidal facilities to really make a large impact. Dams are a larger issue. Let's go back to our understanding of a watershed and how water moves through land. Most rivers begin at the mountains, and the snow melt that begins in spring and later rain falling down the mountains cause the flow of that river. As the river flows, it weathers the rock of the mountain along the way. Eventually, all that sediment ends up downstream at the river delta, where the river exits into the ocean. That sediment is what builds the coastal environments and provides a, quite a bit of mineral nutrients. Without the sediment deposition from the river, these coastal areas begin to erode away as ocean currents pull the material away. Instead of the sediment going downstream, the sediment is trapped by a dam. The sedimentation builds up on the face of the dam, which can take up space and eventually lead to flooding upstream. But it also causes siltation of the river, where all those sediments get stuck, creating relatively murky water conditions. This increased turbidity makes it difficult for river producers, like cyanobacteria and algae, to get enough sunlight for photosynthesis. This disrupts river food webs and alters the water quality. Now downstream from the dam, because water is held back, there is a reduction in the flow speed of the river, which can lead to less water being available for ecosystems and humans downstream of a dam. 
Another dam problem is the impact on fish populations by reducing the range. But none are more affected than the fish that use rivers for migration, like salmon. Salmon are both freshwater and saltwater fish. They spawn in rivers and make their life in the ocean and then swim back upstream on a river to mate and lay eggs. Quite an athletic feat. One thing we've done to mitigate the impact of dams is to install fish ladders so at least some of the fish can make it back up and over the dam. The next most utilized form of energy is wind power. Uh, wind turbines use the kinetic energy of moving air to spin a turbine. Uh, while wind turbines are a renewable and clean source of energy, they also have some impacts. The materials to make the turbine must be mined, but the issue with turbines is that they cannot be easily recycled. See, they're not actually made of metal, even though it may look like it. They're composed of glass and carbon materials, so they're usually just disposed of in landfills, which is not a particularly green way to dispose of things. Birds and bats may be killed if they fly into a spinning turbine blade, and according to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, wind turbines result in the death of up to 500,000 migratory birds per year. Solar energy uses the sun's energy to produce electricity, and there's actually several ways to do this. A photovoltaic cell uses layers of a semiconducting material, uh, silicon. When a photon, a particle of light, hits one side of the cell, it causes electrons to leave their atoms. But to produce an electric current, all the electrons need to flow in the same direction, so here's kind of how we make that happen. The layer facing the sun has phosphorus in the material, which has one more electron than silicon. The other side has boron in the material, which has one fewer electrons than silicon. As a result, the layer facing the sun has a slight negative charge, and the layer on the other side has a slight positive charge. When the photon hits the material, causing an electron to leave, the electron will be attracted to the positive side. String a bunch of these photovoltaic cells together and you have a solar farm, which takes up a lot of space. So solar farms tend to be placed in deserts where there's a lot of space where we can't really do anything else with it. That's a minor issue because photovoltaic cells are most efficient at slightly lower temperatures. Actually, the temperatures you'd find in a grassland ecosystem. But we use that for farming, so we lose a little bit of efficiency by putting them in the desert, but at least we're not farming in the desert. These farms can also affect desert ecosystems by reducing the range of many desert species, like the desert tortoise, which experiences high mortality because of these farms. Now, before one is built, all the desert tortoises are moved to some other area, but even this seems to result in high mortality as they have very specific habitat choices. Another form of solar power is the solar tower, which uses a bunch of mirrors to focus sunlight onto a tower to create steam, which spins a turbine. These are very bright objects, which attract curious birds and burn them, which is unfortunate. There's also passive solar, which absorbs sunlight and uses it for heat, but this energy is not collected or stored. It's actually a way to make homes more efficient. Because the angle of sunlight changes between summer and winter, winter sunlight enters the home for the heating effects, and summer sunlight does not. In some advanced systems, the sunlight is also used to heat water, which is distributed through the house for heating. Geothermal energy is obtained by using the heat stored deep in the Earth's interior to heat up water, which is brought back up as steam to spin a turbine. The cost of accessing geothermal energy can be prohibitively expensive and is not easily accessible in much of the world. Iceland, however, is a pioneer in the use of geothermal energy because of how geologically active the region is. In fact, about 25% of Iceland's total electricity comes from geothermal. The largest user of geothermal, however, is the United States, especially in California and other areas that see a lot of geologic activity. While this form of energy is mostly benign, it can leak hydrogen sulfide gas from deeper in the earth up into the atmosphere, which is very poisonous. And then there's the form of power generation whose only emission is water? In a hydrogen fuel cell, 
Hydrogen is added to one side and oxygen is added to the other, separated by a membrane that only allows protons to pass through. On the side with hydrogen, platinum atoms cause hydrogen to split into one electron and one proton. The proton passes through to the other side through the membrane, while the electron must travel around the cell. And it's the flow of electrons from one side to the other that is the electricity. Remember, electricity is just the movement of electrons. On the oxygen side, the electron and proton combine with oxygen to make water, which is the waste product in this system. Though this method of producing electricity has no carbon emissions, it is still very expensive, and the production of hydrogen also has its own impacts. Renewables are more expensive, and they come with their own environmental issues. But even with those, they are much better than fossil fuels as far as impact for the environment goes. As I mentioned last video, we need to swap to a renewable infrastructure because we will run out of fossil fuel energy sources anyway. And the sooner we do it, the better.